500 million years ago, a volcanic eruption didn't just kill it, froze life in place. Trilobites scuttling along a shallow Cambrian sea were buried alive in a cascade of ash that preserved their bodies down to individual bristles on their legs. For over a century, paleontologists could only guess at what soft tissues these creatures had, but thanks to Morocco's so-called prehistoric Pompeii, scientists can now virtually peel back their exoskeletons. What they uncovered overturns decades of textbook assumptions about how trilobites ate lived and even how their heads were built. For a very long time, trilobite fossils told only part of the story. What usually survived after hundreds of millions of years was their tough armored shell and nothing more. These empty outlines piled up in huge numbers across rock layers worldwide, but they gave scientists little sense of what lay beneath. It was like being handed a collection of empty suits of armor without any trace of the warriors who once wore them. Paleontologists could measure the ridges, count the segments, even study the way the shells molted, yet the crucial details of how these animals actually lived remained locked away. Because soft tissues were missing, researchers were left to argue about basic features that we take for granted with other animals today. How did trilobites eat? Did they graze across the seafloor, sift mud for nutrients or bite into prey? How did they move water across their gills or sense their surroundings beyond the famous compound eyes? These were pressing questions because understanding body structure is the foundation of understanding ecology. Without such evidence, reconstructions became more like educated sketches than accurate portraits sparking debates that stretched across generations of paleontology. Some of the earliest reconstructions showed just how serious the problem was. Illustrations from the 19th century often gave trilobites mouth parts that looked nothing alike because no one could agree on how their heads were built. One scientist imagined broad grinding plates, another guessed at thin probing structures. Both ideas were plausible, but neither could be confirmed. The exoskeleton alone left no clear room for one anatomy over the other, so entire interpretations rose and fell based only on competing assumptions. This uncertainty made it almost impossible to align trilobites with other early arthropods in a solid evolutionary framework. You can think of it this way, trying to explain trilobites from their shells alone is like being shown a freshly painted car and told to describe how the engine works. You can admire the color and the shape of the body, even measure the details of the trim, but the machinery, the gears, pistons, and wiring that bring it to life remains completely out of sight. With trilobites, that missing machinery was their feeding appendages, gills, stomachs, and sensory organs, all made of tissue that usually decayed long before fossilization could take place. Other sites like the Burgess Shale gave hope by preserving softer bodies, but those fossils often appear as thin, flattened shadows compressed by rock. Then they hinted at delicate anatomy, but left room for uncertainty. Paleontologists knew they were circling close to the truth, but clarity was always just out of reach. And so even after two centuries of study, one of the most common fossils on Earth remained frustratingly incomplete. No matter how many shells were collected, the living creature beneath them persisted as a biological enigma. That was the state of things until discoveries in Morocco suddenly shifted everything we thought we knew. Imagine a single moment when destruction became preservation. In the Cambrian seas that covered what is now Morocco, trilobites thrived in shallow waters filled with algae mats and small invertebrates scuttling across the seabed. It was a dynamic environment with sediment constantly shifting and new life forms appearing across the seafloor. But one day, that ordinary marine setting was shattered by violence rising from deep within the earth. A nearby volcano erupted and the unleashed force changed the fate of these animals forever. The eruption released waves of pyroclastic material clouds of searing JS and fine ash racing outward at incredible speed. When this surge met the coastline and pushed into the shallow seas, it had the same effect as it did on human settlements thousands of years later at Pompeii. The flow poured across the Cambrian ecosystem, overwhelming trilobites within seconds and locking them in place before their bodies had any chance to decay. Instead of slow burial under layers of mud, these animals were smothered instantly. Heat and ash hardened around them, leaving natural molds that captured their shape as three-dimensional figures instead of flattened impressions. The effect was extraordinary. Rather than empty shells weathered smooth by time, these fossils preserved fine anatomical features almost never seen in creatures this old. Alongside their exoskeletons lay antennae walking legs and the delicate spines that fringed their limbs. 
Even tiny bristle-like filaments survived in the imprint alongside the internal traces of their digestive tracts. It was as if time had frozen the organisms mid-step, offering a level of detail unmatched in ordinary fossil layers. Scientists quickly drew the comparison to Pompeii, though here the event was half a billion years older and played out beneath the waves. What makes these specimens stand out even more is the evidence of other organisms preserved in situ. Some trilobites carried small brachiopods attached to their shells, and those hitchhikers remained fixed in place as the ash sealed around them. The volcanic sediment was so fine-grained that it trapped details with the precision of talcum powder recording both host and passenger down to remarkable textures. It confirmed that these trilobites interacted with other creatures in life and that those relationships could survive fossilization. Modern tools allow researchers to peer into these stone entombments with a precision undreamed of decades ago. Using CT scanning scientists can build virtual models and digitally peel away the layers of rock, exposing hidden appendages and mouthparts without damaging the specimens themselves. Paleontologist Greg Edgecombe noted that he had never felt so close to studying live trilobites as when examining these three-dimensional fossils. This preservation was not just uncommon, it was transformative. What emerged from this Cambrian eruption were not fragments or guesses, but detailed biological snapshots, which raises the bigger question when those hidden structures were revealed, what major ideas about trilobites turned out to be wrong. The new fossils revealed that the real key to understanding trilobites lies in their mouths. For generations, paleontologists believed trilobites had only three pairs of cephalic appendages behind the antennae. That tidy model survived in textbooks and museum displays because no specimen ever clearly showed otherwise. But the Moroccan material preserved the head region in three dimensions and microtomographic reconstructions immediately overturned the old picture. There weren't three pairs, but four. These appendages had been overlooked in flattened fossils small enough to vanish under compression. Only the unique ash molds combined with CT scans made them unmistakable. That rewriting of head anatomy forced a rethink of how trilobites fed and where they fit in early ecosystems. What was striking was how sophisticated the feeding system appeared. Just above the mouth sat a fleshy plate known as the labrum, a structure still seen in insects and crustaceans today. Its presence in trilobites demonstrated that this fundamental piece of arthropod anatomy stretched back at least to the Cambrian. Anchored around it were the four pairs of feeding limbs tightly clustered into a compact arrangement. The bases of these appendages were broad spoon-shaped and fringed with inward-facing spines. Taken together, they formed what one researcher described as an inward-directed battery of spines remarkably similar to the feeding tools of living horseshoe crabs. This arrangement would have scraped, shredded and funneled material, simultaneously pushing food neatly into the mouth as the labrum guided it forward. Researchers studying the structures noticed even more detail. Some appendages carried slender antenna, like offshoots, that may have functioned as sensors detecting texture or chemical cues as food was handled. The impression was not of a blunt instrument, but of a system adapted for precision able to sample sediment or manipulate fragments of shelled prey. Functionally, this pointed to trilobites being versatile feeders able to graze film on surfaces, scoop organic matter or break down tougher material. In conservation terms, it helps explain why trilobites thrived in so many environments and lasted for more than 250 million years. For the scientists who imaged the fossils, the effect was transformative. Greg Edgecombe of the Natural History Museum, who has studied trilobite anatomy for decades, remarked that the CT models felt closer to observing live animals than any fossil study he had ever done. That sense of immediacy comes from the unusual preservation tiny features rarely visible in compression fossils emerged in three dimensions, including filaments and surface textures that revealed feeding mechanics rather than just skeletal outline. Each scanned trilobite seemed less like a relic and more like a specimen momentarily paused in life. In practical terms, the discovery also rewrote the broader evolutionary context. Trilobites had long been painted as fairly primitive arthropods, an early branch with relatively simple equipment compared to crustaceans or insects. But the Moroccan fossils demonstrated that trilobites already carried a complex mouth region complete with labrum and multiple specialized appendages. This pushes back the origin of key arthropod characters farther into evolutionary history than was assumed. 
It shows that what later arthropods refined into more specialized roles had already begun as an integrated feeding complex in trilobites. Previous textbook concepts lag behind this reality, but they are now being corrected. Scientific illustrations and museum dioramas that once showed a blunt feeding groove are being updated with the newly recognized arrangement, four limbs tightly arranged around a central mouth operating with surprising coordination. The vision of trilobites as passive sediment sifters has given way to an image of adaptable animals processing a range of foods. Whether scraping microbial mats, nibbling soft material or tackling harder prey, their success seems to have rested on this versatility. The Moroccan material made this possible because it preserved not just the shells or legs, but also the subtle machinery of feeding. Without that preservation, the small appendages and labrum would have vanished, crushed flat, like in most other sites. That subtle distinction between a two-dimensional stain and a three-dimensional mold was the difference between endless speculation and direct evidence. Now, instead of reconstructing from shadows, scientists had the pieces in hand. These mouthparts were not the end of the revelations. The fossils also held something even more intimate, the preserved contents of trilobite digestive tracts. If appendages showed what trilobites could do, their stomachs showed what they actually ate. And that interior record offered the closest thing to a diary these ancient arthropods could have left behind. A fossilized stomach packed with broken shells is not just a curiosity, it is the closest thing we get to a diary of how a trilobite actually lived. For decades, their guts were thought to be lost to time, leaving scientists to guess at whether trilobites grazed harmlessly across microbial mats or hunted down prey on the ancient seafloor. That uncertainty has now been stripped away thanks to a handful of astounding specimens that preserved internal anatomy in three dimensions, first in Morocco and more famously in the Czech Republic, where one species, Bohemolicus incola, froze with its digestive tract intact. What made this discovery so powerful was not the presence of an empty gut impression, but the way fine sediments and silicious nodules locked in actual contents. Under synchrotron scanning, researchers saw valves of ostracods, fragments of hyolith shells, pieces of tiny bivalves, and even the remains of an armored echinoderm lodged inside the tract. These were clear signs that trilobites were not simply sweeping up algae, but actively incorporating shelly prey into their diet. Microfossils of Conchoprometia osicensis, a kind of Ordovician ostracod, were abundant, along with hyoliths from the genus Elegantilites. Hard particles like these demonstrated that feeding was not restricted to soft organic mush. The animals engaged with the rigid biomass of the benthic community and passed it into their stomachs. The anatomy itself pointed to purposeful design. Inside Bohemolicus incola, the foregut was split into two ventriculi dorsal and a ventral chamber stacked together near the front of the head. The dorsal portion was larger and vaulted while the ventral section sat below it channeled into a mid gut that acted like a grinding mill before contents slid into the hind gut and pagidial anus. This configuration looked less like an undifferentiated tube and more like a processing unit. It is strikingly close to the design of a gizzard in crustaceans and insects today, where food is gripped, crushed and broken down before reaching the rest of the intestine. The hypostomy, the mouth plate bore a double-walled posterior margin that may have cut against food material as it entered. In effect, the front end functioned like a crusher and grinder combined. The broader implication was durophagy, the ability to handle food armored in calcium carbonate. For a Cambrian and Ordovician arthropod, this was an advanced strategy. It meant trilobites could take advantage of food sources that softer mouthed organisms were forced to ignore. Think of it as carrying a built-in nutcracker inside the stomach, a way to split shells, open, release nutrition, and keep energy flowing when softer prey may have been scarce. Not every trilobite species appears to have done this, in fact, the evidence from Bohemolicus incola shows a more opportunistic scavenger than a razor-focused predator. The gut held a grab bag of benthic scraps, not a specialized set of carefully chosen victims. Still, the constant presence of shell fragments throughout its intestine proved beyond doubt that tough meals were routine. Chemical traces even revealed that the gut environment was not acidic, but closer to neutral or alkaline. That matters because an acidic stomach dissolving large amounts of calcium carbonate would have led to a severe ion imbalance flooding tissues with calcium. Neutral digestion made it possible to pass shattered shells through intact with enzymes working in a chemistry that kept the trilobite alive. 
Taken together, these insights dismantle the older image of trilobites as sluggish bottom feeders taking only detritus. Instead, they emerge as flexible eaters, scavenging, scraping and crunching whatever they could find. This dietary adaptability helps explain how they persisted in oceans for 270 million years before the final Permian crisis stripped them away. From mystery to mastery, the Moroccan trilobites transformed frustration into clarity. For more than a century, shells hid the most important details, yet this single deposit revealed them in sharp relief. CT scans turned speculation into evidence, showing trilobites as active, adaptable animals with complex anatomy and diets far richer than anyone expected. To keep it simple, remember three key points. Volcanic ash in shallow seas can preserve soft parts in three dimensions. Moroccan fossils revealed four head appendages and a labrum rather than three, and gut casts proved trilobites could eat shelled prey. If you liked revisiting ancient mysteries with hard science, consider subscribing and tell us in the comments which detail surprised you most.